Welcome to the U3 Media Podcast, where our mission is to unite the world through coffee, connecting you to the farmers and coffee entrepreneurs through the stories they share. I'm Christy Ross, and joining us today is Jerry Thalman, founder of the Coffee Lab at North Central College. Welcome, Jerry. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks. So I was so lucky to be able to go visit your facilities and see you in action. So I'm even more excited about sharing your story today. So let's start out, give a little background about when you first signed on with North Central College and what your role was back then. Okay. Yeah, I've been teaching here at North Central for 27 years now. It seems like a short time, but it's 27 years. And I I uh, came from another small college, and I came as an accounting professor. And so my original work here was, mo- I mean, still my primary work is is teaching, but the coffee lab has been something that's come out of it over the years. So, so wait, how soon after you joined North Central College did you start the coffee lab? Okay. Um, actually, it started through another organization, but I'd been here about five years or six years when I um, realized and I always knew I wanted to be more than just uh, teaching in the classroom and I wanted to teach more directly with students. And so I worked with an organization called SIFE and I was the advisor for SIFE and then more recently it was changed to Enactus. And that organization uh, had business or students of all disciplines working on business projects. And so I joined that and we did different types of projects. And then it took a few more years till we got into uh, the beginnings of the coffee lab, which was in uh, the year 2004. 2004. So what was the actual spark that you were like, we got to go do this, like literally at the college and make this bigger, you know, and, and talk a little bit about what that structure was like back then. It started, it started real small and almost accidental. Um, this organization, SAIF, uh, we did travel and we did projects and everything. So we needed funding for it. And one day at my church, um, someone was selling coffee after church and she had been to a uh, mission in San Lucas Toleman. And, uh, and I thought, well, this would be a great way to fundraise for our students. So I brought it back to my students. I, I first of all asked her if she would uh, my, like working with us. And she says, no way. She, this was a one-time deal for her. She wasn't going to do it anymore. And so I brought it back to my students and they said, wow, this is a great idea. So we started real simply. Um, it was more of a uh, fundraiser. So we were buying coffee that was roasted in Guatemala, shipped here, and then we sold it um, here on campus and made some money doing it. Um, and one of the intriguing parts of it and one of the parts that was really important to us is the social benefits to the farmers and the financial benefits to the farmers. In 2004, we were right in the end of that really low uh, pricing for farmers. They, they were getting paid really low. This association was actually paying the farmers double the market price. They oh, were wow. paying them a price that they could actually live off of. Right. So we started that way. So here, so so originally you you had the coffee roasted by others, but then what was that that pivotal point that you transitioned into literally roasting your own coffee? Like, what was it? Because listen, you need a roaster, <laughs> right. right? Well, originally, yeah, we were having it roasted by other people, and and the one uh, uh, roasting company that that was doing it for us ended up uh, losing or sold their roaster. So we had to start going other places and, and finding it. And um, after that, we decided, let's check it out for ourselves. What what if we do it? At that point, we were still mostly a retail company. We were buying the coffee. We were still, we were packaging it and all that, but we were buying it. And, and we decided we could be a full-scale coffee company. And when they changed, when they stopped their roasting is when we decided to start looking at it. And um, one of the things throughout, uh, as as an accountant and as, as the people involved here, we've been doing projects and classes. And one of my classes in, in accounting was doing a capital budgeting project. Yes. And they um, did a, a project on buying a coffee roaster. And we found out, whoa, wait a minute, this might be something we could do. And that was kind of what sparked it to get it. 
So Jerry, I can't remember if I told you when I was there or not, but I started in accounting. So I totally appreciate yes. <laughs> that accountants can discover like some really great paths for companies based on, you know, numbers and, and what makes sense for the business. So, so I love that that's sort of how you guys took this next, this next step. From an accounting side and from a business perspective, our project was originally to help the farmers, but it was just as important to us to run it like a business. It had to be sustainable from day one. Mm-hmm. So we weren't just donating money back to the farmers. We were giving them a good price, but we were also making a profit. Right. Well, and and so that's that's actually really interesting because I think that when you talk about the mission, right, the mission of your lab, it's it's a little bit different than let's say you know, certainly other labs across the country, but it it focuses more on the business of coffee, right? Right, right. That's it. We we focus on. Um, uh, the entrepreneurial ventures of the farmers and also of our people. It's also based on relationships. Yeah. We, um, we have a direct relationship with everybody from supplier to ultimate consumer. So, so let's talk a little bit about each section and sort of the types of projects that correlate to the, the various disciplines of the integrated study. Cause that's what you've done. You've taken yeah. this, right? Mm-hmm. And you've integrated it throughout a number of different classes. Uh, So walk us through a little bit of that and maybe just give some examples for the the departments or the class and the type of project they're doing. Okay, let's, um, I wanna go back a little bit to day one. And um, one of the the project has all along been uh, uh, run by two of us faculty, myself in accounting and uh, Matt Crystal in anthropology. And so we came from very diverse perspectives. Both of us had interest in the other areas. I've had interest in social entrepreneurship my entire life, and he's had interest in business. But but we came from quite different disciplines. And as we've grown, we've also grown into other areas across campus. And and for instance, the coffee lab has been working with the bio, biology uh, faculty, and they went down to measure carbon. Uh, footprint in Guatemala this summer doing research. Uh, we have, we have engineering department that's, that's built us a, a cart for, our, um, espresso machine and they're working on equipment so that, uh, people with disabilities or people with, uh, shorter statures can fill the coffee roaster without having to climb a ladder or thing like, things like that. So we've been working with engineering. We've been working with, um, uh, the uh, uh, computer graphics, they've, they've helped us with the design of our label, and they're working on new ones right now for us for a different, few different places. Um, the goal is to be across campus. We are working with marketing. We're working with, with uh, many different disciplines at the same time. I absolutely love that. And I saw the espresso cart. I want one of those, Jerry. <laughs> I got to figure out how to get one of those. So, um, so here, so one of the things uh, we you you were talking about um, when we had the chance to meet was Guatemala and this this co op in Guatemala, right? Mm-hmm. So, talk a little bit about those trips to to origin and and how many you take each year, how many students get to go, all of those things. Okay, I'm going to talk, I'm going to again start way back and then go quickly to the, to today. But um, the first trip we did was in 2005. And uh, we, we this was right after the project started. And, and our students wanted to make sure that the uh, coffee farmers were really being uh, compensated the way the way they were told and all this. And, and so we applied for and got a grant from the Kresge Foundation. And it sent uh, eight of us down there. My problem that I have is that going to Guatemala, I do not speak Spanish at all. And so I went looking for another faculty member and we found Matt Crystal at that point. And Matt had done his uh, field work for his doctoral program in Guatemala and was excited to work with us day one. So we first traveled in 2005. And since then, we have traveled at least twice every year uh, with students, most of the time, a couple times during COVID, students did not travel, but of course we brought the farmers here through um, through Zoom and, and different uh, 
ways to bring them to the classroom, even if we couldn't go there. We take students anywhere from uh, probably the smallest, there was probably about three or four students one time. The biggest is about 16. Um, we also don't want to be um, standing out um, as an issue in Guatemala as well. So we don't want to take one of these big tour buses. We take the local transportation around when we're there. And um, so we've been going at least twice a year. The fall is, uh, December is more of about meeting with the farmers. In uh, May, it's it's more research on, uh, generally more research on uh, crafts and artisans than it is on the farmers. Yeah, well, and you know, you mentioned, well, two things. You mentioned that you're, um, you got a grant from this foundation, Kresge Foundation, is that what it was? Yes. So, so funding and budgets, within you know any sort of academia is hard to come by how did you actually get that first funding though whether it was for the lab or whether it's to take these trips i mean that's what is the i guess what is the um what is the pitch around it of what you guys are doing because that that leads into also not just having your mission be the business of coffee integrated throughout the college, but your mission really is about to carry that through and really truly helping the farmers. So how did you get the funding and the budgeting for, for all of the trips and the lab? For the, for the most part, a lot of it was, was um, raised through the sales of, of the product. Again, we look at this not as a, um, we look at it as much as a business operations and we had to have profits. So the profits would go to help fund students to go. Um, students would help fund themselves some, but there was also research grants on campus that would help uh, for students to go. And so there, there was a multiple, um, sometimes a puzzle of getting enough uh, funding together to get it to work. It was, I don't mean to make it sound like it was easy to do. It wasn't. Um, but uh, there was a combination of things. Uh, but even from day one, we made profits. And uh, when we first opened the lab that first year, the profits were a little bit more minimal because we had so much startup costs to do. Um, but the, the lab itself is pretty well uh, uh, funding except for one employee that is funded elsewhere. Okay, got it. Well, true entrepreneurship, though, right? Like pasting all of this together just to make it work, you figure it out. Yeah, and, and students go to events. They do. The students who travel are part of the the project as well. Um, and and um, the students who travel, some of them are ones who have done quite a bit of work with the project already. And so we want to we do this for pay for them. Some of them are it's to get them involved in the project. And after they go there and see it, they get much more involved. And some of them go strictly for the research. See, so what I think is so cool is that involvement that the students have. I mean, they, they take leading roles, right? And they they have this incredible experience. I want to know, like, why is this not in every school across the country? <laughs> yeah, I've been. Um, it it should be. Um, it's very much hands on. One of the one of the reasons, though, I think that it it's hard to do is it it didn't all start at where it is now. It took 20 years for us to get here. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of evolving from really basic business to uh, full scaled coffee business at yeah. this point. Um, I would love for it to be in more places, but um, it, it's difficult to get to that point. And it has to be organic. The people, it, it, people can't just start it because they want to start a business. Mm -hmm. And um, it also helps maybe that or may help other places as well is that students really like the idea of working with coffee, whether it's because they like lattes or because they uh, believe in, in getting the farmers a better price for their product. Um, but there's lots of reasons that students really do want to get involved in, with coffee. And we do see that in a lot of schools where they do have coffee projects. They just don't have the scale of a project. Right. Right. Well, so one other thing, you know, you mentioned, you know, so the so the lab is profitable, you know, so it's self-sustaining now and it, it essentially covers, um, you know, covers everything you guys are doing and then some. Um, the one thing that you showed me when when I was there is a store that you also have with um, 
I, I believe it's all Guatemalan, but you can correct me, um, other products that you've brought back to sell. So, so talk about that a little bit. Yeah, this is um, another thing that actually Matt Crystal brought with him when he when he did do his field work in uh, Guatemala. He had worked with the the uh, artisans. He never dreamed that he would come back and be able to partner with them in a business type environment. But um, after we were there a couple of years, we decided that we should at least check out this community, and we started talking to them, and they were real excited about working with us. And uh, we have textiles, we have ceramics, we have wood products that are all handmade in Guatemala, and again. Our big part here is um, to find markets for these for these artisans. It's hard to find uh, markets if you don't have access to the U.S. or wherever. And so we started this a couple of years afterward. And, and after we've been doing it a few years, other people in the community were starting to hear from us as well, from Toto Nikipan in, in Guatemala. And so, in fact, uh, a, a chocolate company contacted us and, to see if we would work with them and and. Um, we said, sure, we will. And, and at first when they said this, we were excited. And then we found out, well, they were talking to about four or five other people, too, to get their market to the U.S. And so, you know, oh, that's too bad that, you know, we wish we could, we wish we were the one. But everybody else fell through. And one of the things that has really made this project uh, successful for their, our partners is that we have continued on. Same thing with the coffee farmers. Other people will buy, like the lady I met from church, they'll buy 50 bags and then they're done. Huh. We've been able to continue on and, and the partnerships have, have only strengthened. And um, so we, we, I think we've been real successful that way. Um, and once a few years ago, um, even to measure the success, um, actually we've, we've had people thanking us and being so appreciative um, we've we've had people in tears on both sides oh, wow. of of the project, both here in the U.S. with the coffee project as well as the the Guatemala um, artisans. So um, I know they appreciate it. It makes me feel real good. Yeah, I mean the impact you're having is is incredible. Um, so you know you you talk about uh, you talk about Guatemala. But you, you're also doing this, um, are you buying coffee from other places other than just Guatemala? Right. Once we, when we opened the, the coffee lab, we opened it in 2019, uh, just before COVID. Um, but at that point, we were just buying from Guatemala. And then we had a decaf just because we had to have decaf to go with it. And we realized at that point, if we're going to be teaching about uh, the coffee business to Students, we have to be a real coffee business, and therefore we we expanded to other countries. And in each of the situations where we've expanded to, though, we have only done it where we have a direct relationship with somebody from that country. So, for instance, Marianella uh, from Costa Rica lives in or she grew up in Costa Rica, lives here most of the time, but she bought a farm in Costa Rica and exports for other farmers as well. Uh, Colombia, the same thing, uh, Ethiopia, Papua New Guinea. So in each of those cases, we've been able to expand our product line, but at the same time, just do it through relationships that we've developed over the years. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really important because again, you get to know, you get to know the farmers, you get to have that, that direct relationship with them and, and figure out what they need and, and help them with that. So you, um, so let's talk about the, the flip side of the business instead of sourcing. Let's actually talk about, you know, where you distribute your coffee to okay. and sort of the different, I guess I'll just say, you know, product categories or, or revenue streams, yeah. you know, different channels you sell through. Okay. Um, we have, uh, originally before we had the lab, we, we had events and, and we would go to, um, organizations like schools and churches. And we would sell all of our product there, whether it was coffee or textiles or, or ceramics. And um, once we uh, got the coffee roaster, then we've now expanded to where over 50% of our coffee is actually sold to two different um, uh, private label companies. And both of them are alumni from North Central. So therefore, uh, out of the coffee project, they've made up their own companies. They started their own companies. And one is called uh, Llama Bean uh, Coffee. And it is one of our alumni who had 
who has been an entrepreneur most of his life, but he uh, graduated about seven or eight years ago, and he had a petting zoo, and his favorite animal from the petting zoo was a llama. So therefore, all of his product is based on uh, names related to llama. And another alumni has uh, a fishing company, uh, fishing tackle and, and, and video company, and they've started a fishing uh, uh, business, uh, coffee rum fishing. And then uh, another group, we have two or three not-for-profits that, that buy the coffee and um, provide jobs for, one of them provides jobs for differently abled adults, and they deliver our coffee to different um, customers. And then we still have our, um, we have an online presence, which is starting to grow finally after a few years. We have um, uh, some there, and then we also still have our campus community. And, and finally, our, just this year, our coffee service on campus is all going to be our coffee as well. So it, I, I love that. First of all, I love llamas. So I love the fact that he <laughs> sort of went on that path. I, I, it's totally interesting to me, but that it's all about marketing and actually, mm -hmm. you know, connecting to something that, um, you know, that you love, that you can sort of push and hope that other people, you know, attach to that too. So it's just fun. Same with fishing. So, so the one, um, I, I think the question that, that rings in my head, just because this is so multi-pronged, when you think about the success of the lab, um, you know, and it's integrated studies and stuff like that, I, and and the and the impact it's having on you know on the farmers' lives and and I could probably just start to make a list, but how do you measure success of the lab overall? As as an accountant, um, let me say first of all, the easiest way is by dollars and cents, and right. and that's the way that I I'm always uh, inclined to go back to, but it, but that is only going to be about the current, and so. We are developing a balanced scorecard to uh, to look at how much impact the farmers have had. And one of the ways that we measure that is for every 300 pounds of coffee that we sell, that means one more farmer can sell through this market rather than through the open market or worse yet, through coyotes and getting uh, cents on the dollar rather than, than 150 or 200 percent of the market price. Um, we also look at it, how many students have been involved, how many disciplines have been involved. Um, there are over the last year, um, my students alone, there's been over a hundred students that have been doing projects in classes. Have they been as involved as some of the other ones? No, but they've learned that we do have to deal with the suppliers, not deal with them, but, um, consider them in our business practices. Mm -hmm. And too often I think they're forgotten. Um, the anthropology students and the, and, uh, the science, uh, students are doing research on water filtration, on using coffee grounds for, um, heating purposes for, um, uh, different purposes. And our, and our goal, or we, I think we need to go back to again is, um, I think it would be fun is looking at the caffeine levels of the different coffees we have now. We have had grads or students do honors thesis based on the coffee project. And the more of those, the more successful I think we are. Yeah. I like that you had the science, um, the, the, was it, it was, it was the science, the science, I'm sorry, which class was that that did the, did the caffeine study? You said it, or did you say it, it was, was a grad chemistry students? class? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was not grad students. I started saying that incorrectly. They are not grad students. Okay. Got so it. they're doing it, they're doing it at a, uh, undergrad research level. Okay. Okay. Got it. So let's talk about the customers for a minute. Like, how do you communicate that impact to the end customer? Because I think it's incredible when you look at all these, look across all these disciplines on the type of impact you're having. Like, how do you actually communicate that to the end customer at the end of the day? And my guess is they're super loyal just, yeah. um, you know, after they hear the type of things that you're doing and the, how many people you're touching. One of the things that, um, so a lot of our customers are coming from, uh, students and their families and, and that, that come here. And as, just as an example, I have a, a student who graduated, I think two years ago. And when his mom was here and she was saying, says, yeah, uh, Tommy won't let me go to the, when I go to the store to buy coffee, 
he won't let me just buy it. I need to look at the back of the bag to find out where it's from to make sure that we're, we're buying good coffee. Um, a lot of our customers are, are, uh, return loyal, uh, because of the project and, and it has different reasons for different customers. And some of them are, are completely about the farmers getting more, uh, more money for their product. Others are because of the students that are learning. So we have a, a wide variety of um, customer commitment. And um, for the for the most part, um, they are uh, it's because of relationships that we have have um, uh, developed over the years. And we have traditionally looked more of saying, okay, we need to have relationships with the farmers, but now we're saying um, and making a more um, direct look at the the customers and the relationships we have with them as well. And, and um, we hope that they're buying it more than just for the good coffee. Um, one of the things I, I, when we first started, we were doing it more for the, the farmers and all that. And we were real pleasantly surprised when we found out, you know, not only is it good for them, it's good coffee and people appreciate it as well. So. Is there anything you look back on now um, and wish you would have known when you first started this program? Because timeline wise, you know, 2004, the call it the program, you know, you started the program, but then 2019 is when the lab really, you know, it took on a much more physical presence, right? Um, so when you look, when you look back now, is there something you wish you would have known? Um, absolutely. But I'm going to go back a little bit further than that. I'm going to go back into the 1970s. I wish I'd learned a foreign language. And as I'm saying that, I'm thinking it's more than just me because I wish I'd learned Spanish because that has been a detriment to me when I'm in, in Guatemala. But, but, um, one of the things that this project has, has, um, taught me too is that to, to help students understand why they're taking general education classes. They may not know when they're going to benefit from that class. Accounting students want to take accounting classes. They don't want to take foreign language and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that I think that I wish I had probably done day one or, or 20 years before, 30 years before, was the, the foreign language. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, with that, we've overcome it by we have students that come as interpreters and um and that helps us as well. The The project came along really slow. Um, at times, I wish we would have come much faster, but I'm not sure we could have. Yeah. Uh, it was it was very much of an evolution to get to where we are now. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how I would have done differently. Um, I yeah. love the Spanish, though. I think that actually makes that makes a lot of sense. And not only that, I mean, you know, entrepreneurship, the, the business unfolds. There are things that you can't foresee that are coming down the pipeline, right? Yeah. So, okay, so you've been doing this for almost 20 years, Jerry. This is, this is literally like part of your legacy. So what's going to be next for Jerry? A um, couple of things. One is I'm not done here. I'm getting close to retirement, but I'm... I'm um, as long as there's more more farmers that we can help get their product to the market at a better price, I've still got work to do. Um, and so I still have some to do here. I would like to expand it to um, to talk with with people at other schools or other um, places. Whether that's going to happen, I it has to it has to um, here at North Central. It came from the ground level. Matt and I worked on it. it did not come from administration and if somebody else is trying to do it um i don't think i can go in and help force this to happen it has to be organic mm -hmm. um so i'm not done here yet and i'm uh, right now working on myself getting a title here of of coffee fellow and i think i will i think shortly will too. <laughs> um, so um i'm not ready to stop uh working on it here um i've had look looking at uh, a couple of other people would love us, love for me to come and work with them to one of our partners that we have. 
I'm sure. I'm sure. So, so I'm, I'm also guessing that you get asked for advice all the time from students. So what would, what would you say is the number one piece of advice that you give them, um, whether it's entering the world of coffee or starting their own business? First of all, get a clear picture of, of what they know about coffee and where they want to start. Sometimes we've had students that come that want to do amazing things, but aren't willing to sit back and learn about it first. And so whatever the industry, I think they have to learn about it first, whether it's, um, and, and one of the ways they can do it is by doing volunteer work with us or, or doing work study work with us and, and, um, to, to get a clear picture of what it is and also find out how are they different? Are they, do they want to just be like everybody else and, um, and ask around before we, before we got our, coffee roaster, we must have talked to 30 different roasters around the Chicago area and Chicago and Wisconsin area. And there's, there's a lot of people out there. And the coffee industry is very transparent. I was amazed at how much people wanted to talk to me. And I know you were saying some of the same, Christy, and, and it's true. They, they want to talk. There's, there's, um, I think there's still plenty of demand out there. As one gentleman told me, um, as long as you can find Folgers on the grocery shelf, there's room for more uh, roasters. So um, I still think there is, but there, you also have to find a, a niche. Um, you have to be something that's different. What are you doing that is different from other people? And one of ours, there's two things we have. Is one is the the student involvement. The second is is the direct relationships. Um, place up the road here, um, all of their employees are ex-felons. Um, so they have something that makes them different. And then they work with that to make it a really cool uh, coffee roasting business. Yeah, because people want to attach to stories, right? They want to attach yeah, to yeah. missions. They want to attach to something more than just the product. So right, differentiating right. yourself and attaching to, you know, or creating your brand around a story, like so, so right. important. Um, but I agree with you on the, the coffee industry um, and the people in it. They have been so fabulously open and they are willing to share information and, and teach you and make introductions. It is it is so refreshing for me and it's been so much fun. Um, and and so, OK, I, I could talk to you all day, but I'm going to literally jump into these last couple of questions, which will be pretty fast. So I'll call mm -hmm. them rapid fire. Um, is there a um, is there a coffee publication that you reference that helps you keep up with the trends or hot topics in the industry, or even a coffee industry staff that you find interesting or or religiously follow? I, there's probably three different places I would I would say one is I love Roast Magazine, um, and uh, I have students. It's also uh, good for students to read. It's real easy to read and, and a fun magazine. So I use that. And then second, um, this has been beneficial for us as being a not-for-profit in the school, is that we have a couple of um, or people in the coffee industry who are experts have come to us. And David Myers of the SCA has been w a wonderful help to us. And David Griffins of, of um, Starbucks uh, Reserve in Chicago has come to us and, and been real beneficial. And the other part is, is, is um, just the network that we have with other coffee roasters in the area. Um, we keep in contact with them. Uh, we meet with them. Uh, I do especially. And, um, and they, they've been able to tell me things and help with ideas that I don't think we would have come with otherwise. Yeah. Staying plugged in, right? Staying plugged in and just Absolutely. keeping that, yeah, keeping that open communication, that network, keeping it hot. So, okay, speaking of hot, I have the U3 top three. So very brief answers, just three questions. First one, your favorite brewing method, Jerry? Mine would be um, what I call the Julio, which is uh, Guatemala made Hario. And uh, so one of our business partners makes it there and, and I love it. It's clean, easy and forgiving. Ah. Very nice. And I got to see it, feel it, touch it when I was there. It looks very much like a, um, a uh, I guess like a, yeah, like a Hario or a V60, but right. Kalita, yeah. 
um, Melita, sort of something like that. Yeah, with right. the one hole in the bottom. Um, right. And then, okay, so the coffee drink of choice. It's still a, a, a black coffee. Um, uh, we have the uh, espresso machine here, but I'd still take it black, yeah. even before a latte usually. Yeah, so a black pour over on your... Yeah. The, Absolutely. It's, it, but I want to ask again, that was made with like, it's like pottery, right? It, Correct. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Um, how many cups of coffee do you drink per day? This may sound unbelievable, um, but only one or two okay. is all I do. You know, I used to drink a whole pot of coffee a day. And then when I went to specialty or good coffee, I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm satisfied with one or two and that's yeah. all I have. I'll, I may carry it around for the whole day, uh, the second one, but two is the maximum. That's really interesting. I do love that, though. I think I appreciate coffee so much more now than yeah. I ever have. And before it was just, you know, the coffee was okay and it was massive right. consumption, although I still drink a lot. I still drink too much. So, okay. <laughs> well, Jerry, I want to give you an opportunity to share where someone can learn more about you or about the coffee lab at North Central College. Okay, the, um, the uh, Coffee Lab has a website, which is North Central Coffee Lab, northcentralcoffeelab.com. And then we also have an Instagram, which is at North Central Coffee Lab. And those would probably, we also have a Facebook with the same address. Um, those would probably be the main ones. I'm personally not as um, up on uh, uh, social media as what the lab is. So <laughs> that is good. That those, is they would be the main ones. We'll send yeah. people over to check it out. It's worth seeing okay. for sure. And, and then the other thing is, is if, if they're in the area, um, we love to give tours uh, here at North Central College and, and, um, and tell about our story. If I'm the one giving the tour, I can't guarantee it's going to be a short one. <laughs> it's, it's, worth, it's worth taking the trip. I will, I will vouch for that. So, Jerry, that's in Naperville, Illinois, right? Correct. So, right. yep. So everybody should go check that out. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time when I was out there, Jerry, and also for joining us today. And of course, for helping us unite the world through coffee. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And thanks to you, our followers, for joining us at U3 Coffee. We'll see you next time.